All right, good morning, grade 12. I want you to go to page 57 in your textbook. Today we are going to look at the objectives of the public sector. And this section also is a possible essay question. All right, so this is the second of the two essay questions in Chapter 3. Right, so if we look at the objectives of the public sector, I have mentioned before in class that the government have five objectives. The first one is a high and sustainable economic growth rate. The second one is full employment. The third one, price stability. Number four is a redistribution of income or a more equal distribution of income. And the last one is exchange rate stability and balance of payments equilibrium. Right. So if we look at the first one, which is a high and sustainable economic growth rate, first of all, what is economic growth? We have done this in Chapter 1. Economic growth is when there's an increase in the productive capacity of the country. So in other words, the ability of the country to increase their production is improving. We measure it as an increase in real GDP. Okay, remember we had a whole discussion in Term 1 about the difference between a real GDP and the nominal GDP. You can only calculate the economic growth rate by using the real GDP. So if the real GDP is increasing, it means that we have produced more this year compared to how much we produced last year. So there was an increase in production from one year to the next. That is economic growth. All right, remember when we talk about real GDP, it means that we have taken out the effects of inflation. Remember, the only difference between the real GDP and the nominal GDP is that the nominal GDP is calculated using current prices, and every year current prices increase as a result of inflation. So if the nominal GDP is increasing, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have produced more. It could mean that we actually produce less, but because prices were higher, it looks like we have produced more. If you cannot remember what I'm talking about, you need to go back to Chapter 1 and go look at real and nominal GDP again. Real GDP calculates the value of whether there's an increase in the value that was actually produced in the country. All right, we take out, we use constant prices, so we take out the effects of inflation. So if the real GDP is increasing, it really means that we have produced more. Right, so if there's an increase in the real GDP, it means that the country will have the ability to supply more goods and services. In other words, more needs can be satisfied because we produced more. Right, so when we calculate it, and they can ask you to calculate it in a data response question, you're going to calculate the percentage change in GDP at constant prices. So the percentage increase in real GDP. All right. Um, and the percentage increase, remember, new value minus the old value gives you the difference. And then difference divided by the older value, the pre previous year, near the earlier year, times 100 gives you percentage change. So if you have to calculate, for example, the economic growth rate from 2005 to 2010, you are going to take the real GDP from 2010 minus the real GDP in 2005. That is going to give you the difference. The difference then divided by what the real GDP was in 2005 times 100. Your answer can be positive, which means that there was economic growth, or the answer can also be negative, which means that the economy is shrinking. Right. Now, the idea with economic growth is that the goal of the government is that the economic growth rate must be high enough to create job opportunities so that standards of living in the country can improve. All right. But now the problem is that in order to create adequate job opportunities, we need an economic growth rate of at least 5%. All right. When we go to Module 3, you're going to see we're going to talk about the different strategies that the government have used in the past, and most of them aimed at a 5% economic growth rate. The latest one, the NGP, we're actually aiming for 6% economic growth rate. So even if we have an economic growth rate of 3.4% or whatever, it is still less than 5%, and it is still not a high enough economic growth rate to make a difference to the welfare of the people in the country. All right, 
So what we're aiming for is a high and sustained economic growth rate. We don't just want economic growth because 1% is growth, but that's not what we want. We want at least 5% economic growth rate so that the economy is growing fast enough so that we can create jobs for unemployed people. And that would mean, obviously, that there's less people dependent on the state. So it will relieve the pressure on the budget also. If more people are employed and more people are earning an income, the government doesn't have to spend that much money on providing merit goods to people who can't afford to pay for them. And the government also doesn't have to spend that much money on social grants. All right, so it will relieve the pressure on the government and it will improve the living standards for people in the country because if they have a job, obviously, they earn an income and they can satisfy their basic needs, which will reduce poverty. All right, so that's economic growth. Yeah? Economic growth, we're aiming for at least 5% economic growth rate so that the economy can create jobs for unemployed people. The second objective of the government is full employment. All right. Now, whenever you set goals for yourself, it's always important that you set goals that are achievable. Right. In South Africa, obviously, a full employment is not achievable. All right. It is more realistic to just have a goal of to create employment, they reduce unemployment at least. All right. But the government's most important priority is to create decent jobs. All right. They want sustainable job creation. Right, sustainable means ongoing. So it's not a case of, okay, I have a job now and in two months' time I don't have a job again. Now, ongoing employment, sustainable employment opportunities. Right. Now, the government can use both their macro and microeconomic policies so that they can create an environment that can support labor absorbing activities. All right. Now, the whole idea is that the government is trying to minimize unemployment. Now, as I said, we want to decrease unemployment to make sure that everybody that is part of the economically active population that would want to work are able to find employment. All right. Remember, to be part of the economically active population, you have to be between the ages of 16 and 65. You have to be mentally and physically able and willing to work, and you must want to work. All right. So full employment means that everybody between the ages of 16 and 65 that's mentally and physically capable of working and want to work will be able to find a job. The reason why full employment is so important is that it correlates with other positive socioeconomic indicators. So the minute that unemployment starts to decrease, we will also see a lower crime rate. You must remember when people are employed, unemployed, they don't have an income. And if they don't have an income, it doesn't mean just because I don't have a job now, I'm not going to ever going to get hungry again. People that don't have a job, they still have needs to satisfy. And if they don't have an honest way of getting those things, they will resort to crime. And we had this discussion before. It starts with petty crime and petty crime escalates to more violent crimes. So unemployment, there's a direct relationship between the level of unemployment and the crime rates in a country. The more unemployed people there are, the higher the crime rate. So in order to decrease the crime rate, one of those strategies can also be to create employment for unemployed people. It also leads to better health standards, because obviously when people have an income, they can actually afford to go to the doctors to get the medicine that they need. Right. Now, steps that the government can take to achieve full employment or to reduce unemployment, rather, in the short run, they can accelerate employment creation through direct employment schemes, targeted subsidies, and a more expansionary macroeconomic package. Right, what does this mean? Okay, for example, the macroeconomic package, if we think of the fiscal policy, when the government uses expansionary fiscal policy, they will be able to create jobs, right? Remember we said if the government decreased taxes, that means households, disposable income will increase. The more income people have, the more they will spend. If consumers are spending a lot of money, businesses will see an increase in demand and they would want to increase increase their supply to meet this demand. If they want to increase their supply, they need to produce more. 
And in order to produce more, they need to employ more production factors. One of these production factors is labor. Right. So expansionary fiscal policy can be used by the government, either decreasing taxes or increasing government spending, in order to create jobs in the short run. Right. Direct employment schemes can be, for example, the government has a, a program called the Expanded Public Works Program. We're going to look at that in detail in chapter uh, in Module 3. But what that basically is, it is a job creation strategy where the government identifies in underdeveloped areas what infrastructure is needed, and then they use workers from that area that are unemployed and unskilled. They employ them, they teach them a skill, and then they have a job, but it is a short-term job. It's a contract. Once that infrastructure has been built, the person will one again be unemployed, but he has gained a skill which would make it easier for him to find a job in the future. All right, so expanded public works program, that is an example of direct employment schemes, but we will do that in detail in chapter or module three. Right, in the medium term, they can support labor-intensive activities. Okay, obviously, we all know that if we want to move forward, if the country wants to achieve higher economic growth rates, we do have to go into capital-intensive production methods because it is cheaper in the long run and it is way more productive. But in our country, where the high unemployment rate is a real problem, it is important for us to find a balance. Okay, certain industries that lends itself to labor-intensive activities specifically in agriculture and light manufacturing, that creates opportunities for unskilled people to find jobs. All right, also incentives to encourage private sector investments, which generate large-scale employment. All right, we, the government, we're going to look at also in Module 3, they're providing certain incentives to businesses that are willing to support labor-intensive activities, that are willing to stay labor intensive, that are willing to employ unskilled workers and provide them with skills. This helps the government in their target of job creation. All right, so the government does provide incentives, tax incentives to those businesses so that the businesses also have a little bit of an advantage because they're helping the government in order to create jobs. In the long run, we need to support knowledge intensive and capital intensive sectors so that we can maintain competitive, right? But in order to do this, knowledge incentive and capital intensive production sectors, that means that we have to increase skills, all right? So the long-term strategy is to provide skills, knowledge and skills to people so that they we can move to a more capital intensive production methods in the future and go into knowledge intensive industries. We are also going to look at that in detail in module three. All right. In South Africa, aspects like affirmative action and BEE is also important. Okay, we have spoken about this before, right, where affirmative action and BEE is all about restitution, eh, to correct injustices of the past. When jobs are created, preferences should be given to historically disadvantaged people. All right, if you look at the unemployment rate, that is also where the unemployment rate is the highest. All right. So it's very important that we do targeted employment for previously disadvantaged people. The third goal of the government is price stability. Right. Now, in any market economy, it is normal for prices to fluctuate. Now, anytime the demand and supply changes, the equilibrium price is going to change. Now, by price stability, we don't mean that prices must stay constant all the time. Price stability means that the prices of consumer goods changes by a small margin only. So when it's normal for prices to increase, now it's absolutely normal for prices to increase, but those price increases must be reasonable. A small percentage increase in prices is acceptable. Right, now price stability obviously it's in the best interest of both businesses and consumers. If prices are stable, both businesses and households are better able to anticipate the income and expenditure, okay, and it enables them to budget more accurately. All right, if we know what our income is and prices are relatively stable, 
we can set up a budget. We know exactly what we have, you know, what, our, what the income is that we have access to, and then we can plan our expenditures to fit into our budget. But if prices are changing all the time, if we budget, our budget's not going to be worth much because prices are changing too fast. Right, stable prices also improve investor confidence. And we've spoken about the importance of foreign and domestic investments. Remember, investments is the starting point for economic growth and development. When inflation is very high, it is a disincentive to save. Right, if inflation is increasing very high, it means that the prices of goods and services are increasing very, very quickly. So if I save my money and I'm getting an interest rate of, let's say, 5% when I'm saving my money, after 10 years, when I take my savings out, my savings has grown 5%, but if inflation was 10%, that means my money was losing value by 10% over that period of time. People do not save and investors do not invest if inflation is high. All right, so we need stable prices also to encourage both local people and foreign people to invest. Now, since the year 2000, we implemented a policy called inflation targeting that we are using to monitor inflation. Inflation targeting is basically a monetary policy framework where the government decides on a target Right, and we will do this in detail when we do inflation also later on in this year. But basically how inflation targeting works is the government will determine a target. Our target is between 3 and 6%. Now we have to keep the inflation rate between the percentages of 3 and 6%. Right, once the government has decided on the target, they then make it the responsibility of the Reserve Bank to stay within this target. So the Reserve Bank will then use their monetary policy in order to keep inflation between 3 and 6%. All right. Obviously, if it goes too low, if inflation drops too low and it becomes less than 3%, the Reserve Bank has to use their monetary policy instruments to increase the inflation. And if it goes higher than 6%, obviously, they have to use their monetary policy to decrease that inflation again. We will talk about why 3 and 6%. Now why can't it go below 3? Why don't we want it to go up higher than 6%? We will do those details when we talk about inflation. For now, I just need to know that the inflation target that our government has decided upon is that inflation needs to stay between 3 and 6% and the Reserve Bank has the responsibility to keep it there. All right. Obviously, the Reserve Bank gets to choose the instrument that they would like to use to control this inflation. And in our country, they use the repo rate. All right. Now, one of the benefits of inflation targeting is that it is transparent. Everybody can see whether inflation is within the target range or not. It is published widely. And obviously, then people can make provision. If they see, if the general members of the public can see that inflation is increasing, they know, they can see it. Inflation is increasing. They know the Reserve Bank is going to take action and increase the repo rate, for example. So everybody knows what is to be expected. Okay, now in order to calculate the inflation rate, we make use of certain indexes. We did speak about these indexes last year. And again, we will do them in detail when we get to inflation. But we use the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index. The actual increase in the CPI shows us our actual inflation rate. Now, the percentage increase in the CPI shows us our inflation rate. And then the PPI is the producer, producer price index. The PPI is used basically to predict what the CPI is going to be doing. Because if the PPI increases, it indicates that there's increases in production cost. And when production cost increases, retailers tend to put up their prices as well, which means the CPI is also going to increase. All right. So as I said, if inflation approaches the upper limit of the target range that so gets close to six or it's expected to go over six, the Reserve Bank will then obviously increase the repo rate and the interest rates to cool down the heated economy to make people spend less, name restrictive monetary policy. And if inflation goes close to the lower limit, the 3%, or goes lower than that, obviously the Reserve Bank needs to stimulate the economy to increase that inflation a little bit. And they will do this by increase or reducing the repo rate and the interest rate. Right, the second last goal of the government is exchange rate stability and balance of payments equilibrium. 
Right, again, extreme fluctuations in the exchange rate also creates uncertainties in the markets. At the moment, our RAND is all over the place, right? It's depreciating, then it's getting stronger a bit the next day, then it's depreciating again. So obviously, any um, big depreciations and appreciations obviously creates uncertainties. It impacts on the prices that we pay for our imports. It impacts on the amount of exports that we are able to do. And obviously, there's a direct link between that and the balance of payments. All right. So exchange rates have a big influence on the flow of goods and services into a country and out of the country through imports and exports. All right. And the minute that imports and exports changes, obviously it impacts on our balance of payments as well. Right. Now, what is important here, the choice in the management of an exchange rate system is important here because it obviously it influences the amount of control that we have over the exchange rate. Remember, in South Africa, we use a free floating exchange rate system, which means we have no control over our exchange rate. There's nothing that the Reserve Bank can do to make the RAND appreciate or depreciate. Demand and supply out there in the international markets will determine the value of the RAND. So where the exchange rate is concerned, obviously we are a little bit at the mercy of what the market is doing. All right. Obviously, we need to encourage competitiveness, and we had this discussion when we did the exchange rates. A slightly depreciated rand makes our South African products a little bit cheaper and will increase our exports, which can potentially create a surplus on the balance of payments. All right. Now, obviously, at the moment, the rand is very, very weak. We are also not saying that a very, very depreciated rand is the ideal situation. Yeah, that is also not ideal. And it's, we kind of have to find the middle way. All right. But the government can use both fiscal and monetary policies to keep the exchange rate stable as far as what they can. All right. Remember, we cannot directly intervene in the exchange rate markets because of the exchange rate system that we are using. We have to make use of indirect methods like, again, interest rate. Right. The last... Um, goal of the government is economic equity, okay, in other words, a more equal distribution of income. In a market system, obviously, we saw last year, it does not distribute income fairly. It tends to make the rich richer and the poor poorer, right? So there are people in our country that earn a large amount of money that's very, very wealthy. And then there's masses of people that earn very little. Yeah, they are very, very poor, all right? Now, as soon as there's an extreme difference between wealthy people and poor people, as soon as these differences become very good, very big, the, and the, the, it will create social unrest, all right, because those poor people, obviously, will feel that it's unfair. Why do other people have all this stuff and I have nothing? All right, so it does create social unrest, and it does make the people feel that the government is not meeting their objectives. Remember, it, the government does have a responsibility to make sure that everybody's basic needs are satisfied. All right. So where there's extreme levels of poverty and wealth, the bigger the difference is between the rich and the poor, the bigger the risk is then for social unrest. All right. The government does have a, a responsibility towards its people to make sure that everybody's basic needs are satisfied. Now, what we are doing in our country, what our government is doing to bring about more equality is we make use of a progressive tax scale. We all know this. The more we earn, the higher the percentage tax that we pay on income, all right, on the income that we earn. That tax money is then used to finance social services like public education, like health care. It's heavily subsidized by the taxpayer's money. There's also a direct transfer. Okay, some wealthy people will pay lots of taxes and the money is transferred to some poorer members of society in the form of social grants, okay, the child support grant, the disability grant, old age pensions, um, foster care grants, all of those ones we've done them before. Then we also make use of empowerment policies like BEE and triple BEE. In other words, we want to create meaningful participation for previously disadvantaged people. We also spoke about this last year. Non-cash benefits would include things like feeding schemes, right, where the government goes to the very, very, the no-fee schools, for example, and they provide meals for free to the children that are in need. 
They give food parcels out into the, um, the poorer areas of the country. That's non-cash benefits. Yeah, it's benefits, it's things, um, clothing and food and items that is given to people that cannot afford to buy those things for themselves. All right. The social grants are obviously a cash benefit. And then food parcels and et cetera, et cetera, that would be a non-cash benefits. All right. So obviously economic equity is a very difficult thing to achieve because um, if you are a very wealthy person earning lots and lots of money, you can argue that, yes, I work very hard for my money, and now the government takes 46% of my money away for taxes to look after people that are not working, right? So as a wealthy person, you are going to feel that it is unfair that you have to pay so much taxes to look after other people who are not working, right? But it is also not those poor people's fault always that they are not working. For them, it is also unfair that they never had the opportunity to get a proper education. They never had the opportunity to get a proper job and earn a proper income. So it doesn't matter on which side of the equation you are standing, it is going to be perceived as unfair. All right. So also, once you have an unequal distribution of income, it is one of the most difficult things to fix because it doesn't matter what the government is going to do, somebody somewhere is going to perceive it as being unfair. All right, so the government's kind of between a rock and a hard place here. All right, but they are doing a lot. Now, as I said, a progressive tax scale, we have wealth taxes also, like property tax, like inheritance tax, that is only paid by wealthy people because only wealthy people own properties and only wealthy people inherit, right? If you inherit poverty, you're not going to be paying taxes on poverty, right? Um, and those taxes are then used to supply goods and services to the benefit of society. All right. Right, that's the five objectives of government then, and that is the end of this lesson. As I said, I'm going to leave you now for the long weekend so that you can catch up on all the work. Next week, we carry on.